Assalamu alaikum. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Rashid Shafkat and I'm welcoming you on behalf of QSAP, Quantity Surveyor Association of Pakistan, to the first physical CPD event in KSA. Quantity Surveyor Association of Pakistan is a professional platform where we welcome and support all professionals around the globe. We welcome all nationalities on this platform. The QSCP has recently achieved significant milestones of professional success and signed an MOU with Royal Institute of Charter Surveyors on last Friday, 17th of February in Dubai. The second MOU QSAP has recently signed with UMT, University of Management and Science, Lahore Engineering Department of Pakistan to enhance cooperation and jointly work to enhance knowledge sharing opportunities with university graduates. Today is a special day for QSAP KSA chapter. The chairman of QSAP, Mr. Laik, who is also the chair of RICS KSA, made it all possible. With the slogan, together we all rise. The vision and the mission of the QSAP organization are made all possible. I want to congratulate our VP, Mr. Babar Zahir, and rest of the core team of QSA chapter. Thank you very much for your efforts. <laughs> Dear honorable audience, as you know that today's event is consist of two presentations. So we will take your questions at the end of both presentations and you will have a chance in the end of the event to ask any question with the speakers. Thank you. With this said, I would like to call upon our first speaker of the day, Mr. Laik Hassan, to come on stage please and start the CPD. The subject of the CPD is RICS APC process. Thank you very much. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. My name is Laika Hassan, and uh, this is the first, uh, as Rashidi said, our first event in uh, Riyadh. So I welcome everyone. Um, I will not take much of your time, but before I start my presentation, first of all, I would like to know in this audience, our respectable audience, how many charter members at the moment present? This can you please raise hand who are SO or Amrix? a good number. All right. And how many APC candidates are at the moment in this event? Fantastic. Thank you so much. And I hope the rest of you probably are thinking or planning to start that process of to become a member as CS member. So most of the question and most of the problems start when any student when he's plan and he's think about that let's start for RSCS process. His first question how to start that guideline easily provided on the RICS website that what are the requirement of enrollment and what you need to provide them in order to get your enrollment and complete the registration process the problem is start the guideline of course you have to find your counselor so find the counselor first I will always suggest the person who not just by title MRSCS or by title FRSCS or by title SOC RSCS he must have a knowledge. He must know the process. He was a person who should basically take you through from your registration till your submission and your mock interviews and everything. So that's the process when all, most of the uh, candidates they get confused. They approach me and so many other members and ask questions on how I can prepare my summary of experience, how can I prepare my case study, how can I submit what documents are required, and what are the process. 
So my session today is very short and precise. Basically, I'll give you a few guidelines for those especially who are in APC process and to how to prepare your summary of experience. What are the main key points which you need to consider while preparing your submission and also your case study and before to submit everything, what are the points which you should keep in mind that these are the checklists which I have to go through and make sure that everything is in place prior to upload or submit your documents to RSES. All right. So this is the first competency schedule. Now the first question, as I said, the once you complete your enroll, enrollment, when you are about to start your study, now the question how to start? We all are engineers, we all are quantity surveyor, we all are in a different profession but related to the construction industry. The Puramo works, we everyone, I think everyone is dealing with the Puramo works and the project. And what is project Puramo works is all about? Puramo works is give you a guideline when you start the project and how to complete your project. There are various activities which you add in your Puramo works, like start from is a building, you will excavation till the handover. Likewise, if it is an infrastructure project, again from clear and grabbing or formation to complete your street lights or road marking. So that is the whole process. But how to start and where to start and which activity comes first and how much time you have to spend in each activity. So then you will not get delay or your submission will not get delay because as you know there are two dates in the RSA submission. One is about to start from window start from 1st March to 15 March and the next will be from 1st of September to 15th of September. So if you delay one bad, uh, one deadline, it means you will automatically you will be get delayed for the six months. So how you can keep control and how much time ideally you have to spend on each competency. So then you will make sure that yes, I will not spend more of time unnecessary and I will spending a required timing which is exactly required to be achieve that competency. So as most of the APC candidate, I'm sure they know there are three levels, level one, level two and level three. What are these? I don't want to go in detail because you all know about the word value uh, level 1, 2 and 3. So I just prepared as a just for a sample, it's not something like do not just I'm saying just follow as it is, but this is a guideline for you that how you can control and how you can make sure that you are in a right track and where is your deadline and which window are you targeting to submit your APC uh, submission. So like the first activity as a mandatory, we have 10 to 11 competencies. We have a six core competencies, we have a two optional competencies, then you have to prepare summary of experience after this, then you have to prepare case study, then you have to prepare presentation. All these need time. So the level one is a very easy as I always give you or most of my students an example. If I take a mobile from my pocket and I say, guys, what is this? You will say, this is a mobile. That's it. This is a level one. It's not a rocket science. You know it to go in detail. I'm not asking anything else. I'm just asking what is this in my hand? You can easily say this is a mobile. So this is level one. So level one required a just a knowing, just an information. So it means you no need to spend more and more and time just to achieve level one. What is this? So few days, one day, two days, or you think three days, that is more than enough to spend at the level one. Now my second question is, which mobile is this? Are you using it? You can say, oh yeah, this iPhone, but I have an Android mobile. Fine. It means you know the difference what is iPhone and what is Android and some one of the mobile you must be using it. So it means if you are using this mobile, so you will achieve level 2. But that's required a little bit of more time. Let's say if you can you are considering 2 to 3 days for your level 1 competency. So it means double the days. When your days like 2 days for level 1 should be 4 days for your level 2. All right. You should not spend more than that. Yes, if you require because the some of the competencies, we all don't know everything about the competencies. Some of the QSA, some of the professionals, they are working probably in a pre-contract side in a estimation and tending department, whereas some of our professionals, they are working in a post-contract. So the post-contract guys, they know everything about the pre-contract, but they don't have experience. So suppose procurement and tendering, that's a pre-contract competencies. The person who is working as a post-contract, he know what is procurement tending are all about, but he may not know the process, the detail of procurement and tendering. So how to achieve? 
I don't have experience. I'm working as a post contract. So, and is procurement and trending required level three, which means advice. And what is all advice about? Again, if this mobile, I give you an example. Now, my third question to you that I ask, okay, I want to buy a mobile. Please advise me which mobile is good. So then you will give me a detailed analysis. Okay, if you go Android, these are the advantages, these are disadvantages. If you go for iPhone, what are the benefits of iPhone? Then you will give me a more and more detail to, to convince me that which mobile is good for me. So that's level three. So you cannot give me an advice until you are not using it or you don't know much about the mobile. So likewise, if procurement and trending is not your procurement or it's not your competency because you don't have an experience in procurement and trending. You have experience mostly in the post contract. So how to achieve? You don't have experience. So you can achieve it by reading more and more study material. But academically, you have to achieve a certain level. So then you will be able to answer an advisory level or a recommendation. So it means for level three, let's say again, it's just an idea one week time or 10 days, which is more than enough. So once you have all these deadlines, so when you easily, you know, okay, my first competency is about to start, supposed to be start from 20th of February, level one, finished by 27, that finish, including the writing of summary of experience. So the, for summary experience, I will just, I will let you know just in my next slides, how to achieve the uh, right to summary of experience. So if you will have these deadlines, you will have this schedule. So if, let's suppose, it's, as I said, you're supposed to start by 20th of February, due to any reason, workload, family issues, you was on vacation, or there was some target being given to you by your superior, by your land manager, you were not able to start, but you was busy on, on 20th of February. And now today is 24th. So it means already four day delay. And you are planning to start now from tomorrow. So tomorrow will be 25th. So if you change the date from 25th, so it means that the second submission date and the subsequent act, uh, competencies will automatically get delayed. Am I correct? So if you have the schedule, you can focus your schedule. You can focus your deadline. You can focus your submissions. And you know, once you all complete the core competencies, then case studies. I keep the 60 days for the case studies and the summary of experience. Then revision and file assessment, of course, you are mocking tools and everything. So that kind of schedule, you can change it, you can tweak it by yourself, whatever you like it, according to your competency, because different pathways. Again, I don't want to go on that detail like QS and construction, project management, building surveying, and other options. There are 22 pathways, by the way, in the for the MRSCS route. So this is very, very important as a first principle to start your journey to become a chartered member. Now, level one and two, three, as I already explained to you, what is level one is all about, what is level two is all about, and what is level three. So that's the explanation, which I already explained to you, that level one, you must provide a statement of learning, how you gain the knowledge and understand, and that's it. So there are a certain wording required to write a summary of experience. So if you write, let's say, 400 words for level one, it's a waste of time, waste of energy for you. So you should understand first what is required. So the APC guide will help you and also understand of level one. What is level one? So it means if it's level one and you have only three, four days to complete your study, I mean knowledge and writing on top. So just how you gain the knowledge and understanding and that's it. So do not spend more of your time and more of your energy in level one. Move to level two. You must provide a statement of the range of experience you have achieved, including real life project process example. Here in level two, basically you have to write a little bit more wording about more than level one and give some examples that how you doing this competency, how you achieve that competency. Again, as I, as I said, you might, you might, you don't have an experience in that competency. You don't need to say I'm working while working on so and so company. I achieved this while working here and I achieved that. No. You say, I came here while I was studying, I achieved while attending one competent, uh, CPD event, I achieved this competency while I, was, I attended a, a seminar, any course. So if you don't have a work experience, don't think that how you will write that somebody of experience of level one or level two, right, academically. And that's why these CPDs even will help you to understand. Level three, 
you must provide a detailed statement of advice given and include real life project process example where you have personally given advice this word advice keep in your mind i will explain you further when we go to the detail in the summary of experience for level 3 so here as i said you have to write experience so in how you will write how can, how you can give an advice to someone again if you don't have a knowledge you cannot give advice so in order to give your advice you have to gain knowledge first so if you don't have experience knowledge learn academically attend some cpts discuss with your counselor discuss with your colleague who are in that field and for example procurement and trending if you are a pre-contract guy fantastic you're doing by yourself you have good experience you don't need to ask anyone you might get some further detail or further uh, information from your colleague or from your line major from your supervisor but you need to ask because you're already doing it likewise if the pre-contract guy he has no experience let's say in a, a project financial controlling to prepare budget cost control profit loss account this all are the post contracts when we do our uh, profit and loss account our project uh, budgeting and everything so if you don't know ask your colleague your friend someone who is working in the post contract and learn those, uh, uh, those, those knowledge and then start writing it so these are the three levels which you have to very clear in your mind you have to keep it that what exactly level one to ten how much time you have to spend on this as I always advise all, all the students that please do not spend more time which is not required unnecessarily you, because your time is very very constrained you have only two windows keep in mind okay rs is looking for advice that you can do to relevant job at the required level for some competencies one of your example may be sufficient for other companies you may need to provide multiple examples what does it mean it means that if you are given example for level two that while working on this this company i did this one and this is how i got my uh, achieve my level uh, com level two competency or you say i am doing it and that's what I'm providing my information, my report to my superior, to my client, to my uh, head, whoever you're reporting to. Or if you yourself working in a very uh, lead position or a manager position or director level, so you, you must be uh, uh, reporting to someone who is the next person. How are you providing the information to them? Give an example, any live example. If it's level three, add two examples if it's required. If it's, you think that one example is enough, fine. One example just write in the summary of experience level three. Buzzwords. While writing some of experience, buzzword is very, very important. And how you know the buzzwords, from where you get the buzzword. So the RSES guidebook will help you to understand what is the buzzwords all about. So these are basically I extract from the RSES guidebook. This is uh, uh, the contract administration uh, uh, guidebook. And you can see from level one, level two, and level three, I highlighted few words. As you can say, then you can see here level one the various standard form of contract and subcontract used in the industry so it means in level one what do you have to write they're asking you about standard form of contracts so what are standard form of contract you must be aware i'm sure you must be using one fedic because in this industry middle east we are most of the time we are using only fedic contract it's heavily amended from project to project but it's just fedic but fedic is not just the only condition of contract available in all over the world so you must know what are the other condition of contract they are NEC they are JCT there are many other condition of contract which is available so you have to write that okay I know about these computer uh, uh, standard form of contract which, which is FIDIC 99, FIDIC 87, FIDIC 2017, NEC what are the options in the NECs and the JCT various stages of contract what does it mean the various stages of contract means pre-contract post contract close out inception uh, pte when we prepare the post tender uh, estimation so these are the stages of the project so you have to write about it if you are involved in any of these stages level 2 issuing instruction again this is back of our hand we all know what is instruction we use our website is rfis request for information the cvi confirmation of valuable instructions all these instructions are considered as instructions so you have to write some example about it where you're dealing with what are the importance of those instruction in your field payment provisions again i know to go because this all i'm sure you all and uh, everyone must be experienced about what the payment options are 
Payment option is always in your condition of contract, scale later in your contract that how you have to proceed with the payments. If you are a contractor, what is your submission date of interim payment application? If you are a consultant, and within the how many days you have to review the contractor submission and provide, prepare your recommendation and submit to the client. And being a client representative or being a client QS or being a client senior QS or contract administration or manager, within the how many days you have to review the engineer recommendation and submit to your finance department for the payment. So that's all the procedures you have to write where exactly you fall. If you are a contractor, write about your procedure. If you are a consultant, write about what procedures you are following. Dispute avoidance, change procedures, provisions of issues, certificates. So again, this all related to your payments and dispute. And as a, I mean, dispute avoidance. Again, you all know if you go through with the, uh, your FIDIC contract or whatever the contract you are following in your project, there is always a dispute resolution mechanism provided in the contract. When you see, and usually this is all you will find at the end of the contract. So read it. What is the dispute uh, resolution process given provided in your contract? Give, a, give an exam example in your summary of experience. Level 3, resolving disputes. Again, process is there. Process is there, but how to resolve? How to resolve those issues? Is all provided in your condition of contract. Read it and write it here in summary of experience. Extension of time. Loss and expense. Contractual right, obligation, contractual rights. What's a contractual right? If you are a contractor, you must know what's your contractual rights. If you are a consultant, you know what's your contractual right and how you can support or protect your client. And being a client, you must know what is my right and what's the contractor rights, what contractor and consultant obligations are. So everything provided, give you an example with advice, with recommendation. The second, design economics. I just highlight a few words for your understanding. By the way, by the end of the session, we will share the slides with you. Our admin will provide you the PDF copy of these slides. Level one, as I clearly explained to you, it's just a knowledge and understanding. Candidate defining the competencies, seeking to demonstrate relevant learning. Learning can be drawn from your experience. Good to see range of learning methods, different kind of examples. Show willingness and keenness and develop continuously means if you do not have an experience as I earlier said, don't worry about it. Right? I achieve these competencies while reading these and these books or study material and however, I am still committed to learn more and get more experience and competency. Why? Assessor is not going to ask you that where is your experience. You can say, okay, I don't have experience. I didn't work in this competency. But I know how to achieve it. I know academically what this competence is all about. So this level one. This example of level one competency. One of the student, APC candidate, he write this computer experience. Now read it. From my university course, I became aware. Okay, I highlight few points to understand how you can write level one competencies. What are the words you have to write and make sure that this must be there in your summary of experience. Of the various form of contract, in case I have typically used FIDIC form of contract. You no need to write that you have experience in NEC. Nobody is going to ask you in the interview. You no need to ask about, uh, write about that I have experience in JCT. Just write you know all these uh, condition of contracts. I have studies. I understand choices of contracts depend. Complexity of the project. So all these are the buzzword which you have to write. Try to write. I'm not saying that copy and paste exactly these words in your computer in summary of experience, but this is an example that how to write a summary of experience. Level two, practical application of knowledge. By the way, why I mentioned here in the green color required level of because ASOC, those who are actually in the process of ASOC RSCS. They do not need to be write anything about level 3. So level 2 is their max achievement. So looking for one or two example, looking for a detailed explanation experience, example of real life project. Again, 
even though I, I boldly this word, the real life experience is ideally is good to write any practical experience, ex practical uh, scenario from your uh, ongoing project or your previously completed project where you have worked previously. But again, I say this is not set in stone. There is not something mandatory to write. As long as you can prove it that you have a certain knowledge, you have a knowledge of level two to give an answer in your final interview. Using the word demonstrate specific involvement, management of the situation and subsequently experience. This example again from one of the candidate. I highlight few buzzwords. This is prepared by the candidate who already passed the interview. So this is ideal to understand how to write some of your experience for the level two. So see, I executed means he is talking about he has he was involved it means the word when he say I execute means he was involved in that uh, competency that work different projects of concrete is steel structure system because that's by the way keep in mind there's a construction technology level level two so in construction technology you have to write more about the construction technology what kind of process what uh, different technology used uh, and what and what the different uh, technology you, you are aware about and you have experienced it I compared the concrete and a steel st structure system concrete frame error steel isolated footings column slab block work so these are the key or these are the buzzword when you write these words so the assessor will understand that this candidate he knows what the customer technology is all about if you will not write these words these buzzword it will show that you just write a very superficial kind of a statement like this is customer technology i know about what engineering is all about i know what technology is all about he is looking what you know as a candidate about customer technology, how you give them give them this feeling by writing this buzzword that you know this all word, you know this different technology, this different mechanism in the customer technology. What happened? Yeah, okay. Reason advice, depth of knowledge. Again, I already explained you very well about the level three, but just I will read it for you. These are the level three, which is a very, very important, especially for those who are planning to become an MRSCS. Keep in mind, most of your questions will be focusing level three. The assessor will be focusing more on level three to check your knowledge. Because what is APC definitely will do another separate session where I will explain you about the interviews, techniques and uh, how to answer your question in the file, uh, file assessment. We will arrange a separate session for that. But this is only just because the tips for how to write your some experience and case study. So depth and breadth of experience, specifically when advising client or senior management. So it's not necessarily that if you are working only as a consultant or a client, you can write this or achieve this uh, level three. While working as a QS in a subcontracting company, you can still achieve this summary of uh, this level three. And how? While reporting to your senior management, you must be reporting to someone. So you know to think about it, I'm not dealing with the client, I'm a subcontractor, you are dealing with the main contractor, fine. But wh whoever you're dealing with, you're being advising at a some stage to your senior. Give an example, and that's it. The ability to advise effectively comes from experience. Again, it comes from experience. But if you don't have experience, what I said, achieve your knowledge, how? Academically, read competencies, read books, read articles, discuss with your line manager, discuss with your senior, discuss with your counselor and get this knowledge. By the way, while anything you discuss with your counselor, you can still consider those as a CPD. Okay. Candidate can backup advice when challenged. What does it mean? Backup advice when can challenge. You already give one example in your level three. First, let me go to the level three example and I will tell you what does it mean by the candidate can back up advice when challenged. So these are procurement and tendering level three. When conducting commercial evaluation on program, my first task was to checking tender written slips for compliances, for example, to ensure that all bids form were returned. For example, tender bonds, suggestion of contract amendment, insurances, price, BQ, BQ. All and then I proceed to the conduct line by line appraisal. So, this is a process how you evaluate tender documents when the tender is submitted as a you as an engineer. 
एज अ कंसल्ट इंजीनियर और एज अ क्लाइंट कमर्शियल पर्सन द चैलेंज वट आई वॉज आई आस्क यू प्रीवियसली प्रीवियस लाइट दैट यू ऑलरेडी प्रोवाइड वन एग्जाम्पल हेयर द एसेसर मे आस्क यू इन द फाइनल असेसमेंट ओके मिस्टर सो एंड सो यू क्लियरली एक्सप्लेन इन यूर सम एक्सपीरियंस दैट यू हैव कंडक्टेड दीज एंड दीज वैल्यूएशन यू नो अबाउट टेंडर बॉन्ड्स इन यूर सो एंड सो कंपनी वेर यू आर वर्किंग वॉट यू हैव डन अदर दैन दिस कैन यू गिव एस एन अदर एग्जाम्पल सो यू आर यू शुड बी रेडी नॉट इन राइटिंग सम एक्सपीरियंस इन द फाइनल असेसमेंट that what is second second example you can provide them you can say yes that's what i achieve it i did because i was involved in that project even though uh, currently i have prepared recently one i uh, did the tender evaluation where we faced this problem let's say the tender submission uh, delay of tender submission bond how you resolve that issue so keep some second option keep a second example as an option if assessor will ask you in the final assessment not in a summary of experience now case study requirements so that was the first part for some experience now i will tell you about some tips for the case study so case study again should not be more than 24 month like 2 year old your uh, uh, case for example if you are writing your case study now in 2023 so your case study should not be older than 2021 it start from january 2021 till the date where you are preparing your case study or uh, your some uh, your case study for example now with this uh, february should not be more than january or february 2021 so that's the one thing if the date will be old so probably your submission will be referred by the in the during the preliminary assessment professionally produced means write in a proper way in a structured way maximum 3 3000 word that's again very important that's the reason i highlighted keep in mind now rscs has a zero tolerance policy in terms of wording i know many candidate their submission got rejected because of their wording exceeded only 50 words you think 50 words is nothing there must be a plus minus there is no plus minus it used to be plus minus something like 100 or 50 words now your summary of experience will be rejected if it exceed more than 3000 word but again this 3000 word it does not include your uh declaration you are uh, you can say um, explanation you are headings and also you have to write very clearly the 3000 word start from your main structure till end i will let you know the what main, main structure i'm talking about and then relevant content appendix 6 i will again further explain you what is appendix is all about so case study in this session you should summarize the project and what your role was including the following this session these are basically the bullet points which i consider that you must know while writing your summary of experience if you will not consider this summary of experience is very very critical because it will be a 10 minutes question answer only related to your summary of experience you have to prepare uh, sorry your case study you have to prepare your presentation based on your case study you will be interview for the next 10 minutes by all three panel member the two assessors and the chair they will ask question for your case study only only about the case study then they will start talking about or asking about some experience so the first part is your case study so that is a very very important thing so you have to focus what did you do what was or what is your uh, level of responsibility your stakeholder your timeline like for example what is the project duration what is the condition of contract and what is the project value if you want to write it if you something if you feel that is not to be disclosed due to any reason you can write a statement uh, declaration in the uh, in the beginning of your some new experience you can say the project name or uh, a company names as in modified due to any security reason or any reason if you don't get the approval from your line manager or your company my approach the first thing is in this section you should describe the key issues or challenges in the project explain the issue make it clear by the way before i move forward there is a very very common questions which most of the candidate they ask about the summary of the, uh, the case studies that sir how to select the case study title what is case study all about i i never dealt any of the issues in my career because i am just a qs who has experience of let's say 6 and 8 years how can i write come summary of experience i'm the one basically who assisting to my land manager who assisting to my senior qs 
I'm talking about those who are working in a junior level, intermediate level. If you are senior, definitely you must be dealt with so many issues. So you can write easily, you can select any case study. But how to select cases? They, I know there are many seniors who have been working in the in the field, let's say for 18 years and 20 years and 25 years, but still they don't know which topic they should select to write their summary of uh, their case study. So what is case study? Case study could be anything, anything which you think that this is one of my achievement. And I'm sure there must be something. And if you think still I cannot remember, I, I, there are so many things I achieved, but I cannot just focus on one particular topic. Take five minutes, write, pick a pen and a piece of paper and write what you're doing on a daily basis. What is your responsibilities? Your responsibilities probably if I start on the contractor QS, prepare my variations, writing a letter, preparing payment, of, uh, payment applications, preparation of uh, claim, if not preparation, assisting the claims. And then it should be balanced with your experience, your profile. For example, if you are a QS, you have a six year or eight year experience QS, and you start writing about a case study for claims or arbitration, I'm sure no. The assessor in the first stand, he will pick you and he will say, no, this is not your summary, of, not your case study. Because how a person who has a six year experience and is resolving the disputes, no way. So your case study should match with your profile. Likewise, if you have a 15, 16 year of experience, you have a 18 year of experience, you are working as a senior QS contract administrator or senior commercial manager or commercial director or something. And you prepare your case study based on the variation. There is the four variation I prepared. Oh, come on, seriously? This is what you, you said your achievement? So your case study topic should match with your profile. Again, back to the first question, fine, it should be matched with my profile, but I do not have any achievement so far. Then how I can write? I have so many things in my plate, but I cannot pick a single piece to write a case study uh, on, on, uh, on my case study on it. So as I said, pick a pen, write your responsibilities in, in a page, okay? And then think in this, 10 bullet points or 10 numbers of your responsibility which you do day to day basis in your office. Whether you are working as a quantity surveyor as a quantity company, you are working as a consultant, as a cost consultant or as a client. I am sure every one of you who are sitting here, he can easily give me a 10 bullet point. This is my day to day responsibility. And then think out of this 10, which one really I am very good all about it. I am sure you all will be, if all those 10 points, if you list it down, You'll be good on those, but there'll be one point where you think this is my core. This is what exactly all are related to me. I'm very good in it. Pick that and then think, zoom in and think, okay, if this is my core competency, this is what my core strength, this is my core experience, this is my core strength and how I can write. What is maybe that could be payment application. We know the payment application is a very easy process, always defined, the formats is available, but still sometimes we face problem. I remember other day, I think yesterday we were discussing in our, uh, one of the WhatsApp group about the wet. People are discussing about the wet, which is a very common, but still people get confused. So you can pick that wet issue and start writing. Write only one or two paragraphs. What you think that this is something I can talk about. On this top this point and then discuss with your counselor tell him mr counselor i'm thinking that i can write on this topic and this is my synopsis this is my idea to write he will further guide you this is his possibility to guide you that okay no mister this is not the something you know you should really write about it or yes this is a good point let's add more content in it so I will give you a very example, like for example, we go and watch movies, everyone watch movies, okay? In the movies, what we watch? This is the one theme. One theme is whether is it a romantic movie or is it an action movie? There is a hero who has a mission, he has a team, he accomplished that mission, he kill all those bad people and happy ending, finish, done. It's just one line, but the movie is one, and one, hour, one hour and 40 minutes. So what the ad, the director add in that movie different action uh, scenes, different comedy dialogues to make it stretch up to one hour and 40 minutes. So if you, if you know that title, if you know the theme of your case study, you, then the counselor will help you 
or any of your colleague who has a uh, MRSCS, he can tell you what spices you can add to write 3000 word. So back to again first point, take the paper, write 10 points, zoom in on focus or one or two points and then think what you can write if this is your core competency. All right. Then the, uh, my achievement is the third session where you demonstrate your ability to think logically, laterally, professionally and give example of where you give reason advice to the client of level three competencies. Conclusion. Closing is a very important remarks where in this section you need to reflect on analyze your performance and make reference to the lesson you learn and what you would do differently next time. In this session is very important showing basically what does it mean. You start your case study. You have a three options to say okay these are three options because every problem has a three points to resolve. It could be four points, could be maybe two points, but ideally is a three points, three key, three main points to resolve any issue. For example, if you don't have a car after the event, you have to go back. What option do you have? Either you ask any of your colleague, can you please drop me? Or else book an Uber or Kareem, or else walk to your home. That's it. There must be three, four other four options to ask lift someone go to the road and ask the lift to drop me somewhere. But that's four, maybe is not required. Three main options. Ask your friend, you don't have car, get the Uber and Kareem or go, walk, go by walk. That's it. Which one you will choose? Suppose you go by walk, then you say the reason of first rejection. Why you didn't get the help from your colleague? Oh, ask my colleague because he had some appointment to go somewhere else to pick his family, maybe to mall. So he would say sorry to me. So that option close. The second, second one, Uber and, and Kareem. Yeah, I booked, tried to book an Uber and Kareem, but for the peak or rush hour. So all the captain was declined my request. That's why I couldn't get any taxi over in Karim. So the last option for me left is to walk home. So that's how you have to explain your case, uh, the key issue and your options. I mean, these are three options available. That's the reason I didn't consider this one. That's the reason I didn't consider the second one. And I considered the last one because of this. Then appendices. Appendices com uh, competency demonstrated in this case study. You need to use a template or list of competencies that you believe are demonstrated in your case study. It must be three to five competencies you have to achieve in your summary of experience out of your mandatory <coughs> core and optional competencies. So you have to list, you have to attach as appendix A and write what four or five competencies you have achieved in your case study. It could be ethics, business, health and safety, document rendering, commercial, design economics, anything. So you have to write in your uh, uh, appendix number, appendix A. So then the assessor will know that these competencies you already covered in your case study. Appendix B and C, you may insert illustration photograph. Yes, that is the very, very important point. The one last one you just see, I can highlight it here with underline, think as an assessor. Even I will guide you one more thing. Even if you are planning to enroll for APC or you are already preparing yourself for the final assessment or prepare or writing your summary of experience case studies, download because you all downloaded the, uh, your guidebook from the RSC website, download the assessor guideline. There's nothing to do with you. You are not an assessor, but download the assessor guidebook and read it to understand what the assessor think and what he want to know or he is looking forward in your submission. So think in his mind that when you know, okay, that assessor, he want to go through this, 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 this is what the information he will be looking forward in my submission. So I have to must consider it. So think as an assessor. I have seen so many submissions where the candidate, even the final assessments, the candidate, they submit their submission with maybe eight and five appendix, just random appendix. We don't know what the logic of this appendix is. Why you attach my dear five or six pages? What is the link? Highlight. If you are referring any contract within your project, cloud it, highlight it. Why in this page, I write this clause because this clause I have basically referred somewhere in my case study. If you are referring or you can say attach any drawings from your project 
or any sketch or any plan just to give an illustration just to give your assessor a guide that how you prepare your case study and why you refer highlight write it that this is been attached because of this reason why what is why what is it related to your case study not just random attach five six uh, appendices which, which has no any point is a waste of time for us as assessor we, we do not go through we just see four or five pages of appendices is a boq is a condition of contract pages is a drawing is sketches maybe some instruction some letter copies but what is the point why you attach me why why, why should i spend my time to go through all those submissions all the passage write it why should i read that one highlight clouded write some note on top so then the assessor will know okay yeah this is the he provided the candidate because of this what is how is relevant to your case study so that is very very important your your appendix is what you attach at the end of your uh, your submission final before you submit draft review first before sharing with your counselor your first of first point of contact is your counselor before sending to him this is a normal thing which is like a spell check in a word document do the spell check then share with your counselor get his comments first his or her comments incorporate those comments then usually i advise to minimum share your submission with the two chartered member if you will not find any charter member share with your land manager if your land manager is one of the typical land manager who doesn't give <laughs> anything like to to you and say it's your baby my dear i don't have to involve in this one i don't know about rsc is all about okay go to any of your senior even if you will not find anyone else ask your friend who has no knowledge about rscs who does not know probably about the rscs what is rsc is all about he doesn't know what is case study give us like a like a novel tell him this is 10 pages can you please read it and give your comments do you understand this what i writing here he can write it he can read it as a as a novel as an article that is just tell him read it only and give me what you, your feedback maybe he will come back to you and say oh yeah you write it but what does it mean by this word the sequence you have provided it does not look because if he is an engineer he can give you at least some tips something he will share with you incorporate all those comments and then go with the fourth one which is a proof reading which is also very very important because most of us english is not our first language rscs they knows about this that we come from a different background where we do, does not speak english as our first language we have a different language we speak not the english is the first english is our professional language which is they understand but it does not mean that your level of submission should be that poor that the person who is reading it in a different nationality even though he is not a western guy but he will he will is also struggle to understand what exactly you have write it to so do the proof reading normal spell um like a spell check as i said formatting so once you have done everything as a final draft review and everything is done your your counselor say a counselor approved it your land manager approved it you done the proof reading everything is complete now is your time to submit your documents to rscs but again before upload your documents on arc before sending them sharing them on email just last time read it by yourself again even you know inside out about this submission because this is your baby you have written all everything but again thing are you satisfied if you think um no still i'm not i'm confused about this one point which i selected or one of the key issue i selected still you have time change it because this is whoever play the role here your counselor charter member land manager they are not going to attend the interview my dear you are the one who is to go face the assessor and the panel you have to answer their question not them you cannot say if we say okay mr so and so you written this key key issues this is totally rubbish there's nothing to do with the case study and you say no my counselor advised me to do this one you cannot say or oh, my friend say my land manager say no this is the best one where is he oh let me call him no you have to answer you have to defend your submission and how you can defend until you not satisfied so you have a last chance before uploading that are you satisfied if you satisfied good then check founds sometime i we receive uh, case studies where there were so many founds they have used it looks not very professional way we all are professional we prepare different reports in our company 
project report, weekly report, daily reports, monthly report. We participate. If we do not prepare by ourselves, we at least participate in those reports. So make sure the founts are okay. Make sure the formatting, alignment, page setup, page numbering. You know, this is your professional document. When you enroll with RSCS, by the way, RSCS, when you say, okay, Mr. So and so, we have received your application and we accept it. This is your route. Please proceed. So they accepted you that you have all the essence, you have all the qualities, you have all the qualifications, you have all the skills to become a charter member. The time of this submission will demonstrate that yes, you are capable for a charter member. You are capable enough to take this title with you. So if the formatting will be wrong, the forms is the basic thing. This is the basically the present you. The, the impression because see you will come for a final interview after two months your submission will go two months before to the, uh, to the assessor or one month or one month or three weeks before to the assessor so that will give you a reflection if barber is here so i don't know who is barber i'm assessor i received the person okay this is a barber submission very poor yeah. i mean what is this guy drafting is poor no page setup headings so many founds it's like scattered everywhere so the impression I created as an assessor very bad for him and I'm going to see him after two weeks but the impression the perception I created for him is very bad negative so because the human tendency so is the first impression is the last impression so that's your first impression your submission that has to be perfectly show who you are before you go physically or in person face your face your panel so if everything will be good properly managed, formatting goods, founts are good, alignment, page number, title, headings, everything is good. That give us as a feeling when we receive the submission, yeah, this guy is good here. I mean, see how he prepared the structure, the appendices, everything properly, you know, professionally. So we just prepared our mind that who we are going to see after a couple of days, this guy is brilliant. The way he prepared, now it's time to ask question. Thing. So I already prepared my mind as an assessor that I'm already start liking you basically and I'm ready to pass you. But now is your time to demonstrate your skill. That is different thing we'll discuss about in the, in the final assessment process. And then alignment, page setup, page number, this is again basic, basic thing, but make sure that sometimes candidate, they prepare very, very beautiful document draft, but they don't focus on small, small things. So please make sure before you submit everything, all boxes should be checked, but I'm just asking you here. And that's it from my side. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Laik. Uh, indeed, it was very informative uh, session. Now, all of us, we will have 10 minutes of networking break. See you all after 10 minutes. Thank you. Now, I will call upon Mr. Babar Zahir to come on the stage and educate us on the second session of this CPD event. Mr. Babar Zahir, please. Hello, everyone. My voice is uh, clear to you. OK. Actually, today, half of the guys are my friends. so. I think this is the lifetime opportunity for them to learn something from me. <laughs> okay. Construction claims. Actually, from a very long period, I felt this gap. Uh, usually, actually, I've been involved in some interviews. So, uh, especially the time claims, because we QSs, we think that this is something uh, distant uh, from us. So, we, ne we don't need to learn or anything uh, about the time claims. So, my focus will be on time claims uh, basically usually you know in in, in the construction uh, contracts if you see fidic jct or nec there are some uh, definitions for the variations but claims usually they are not addressed properly so i would like to uh, just give you a brief in my opinion this is the bare minimum you should know about the claims <clears throat> so let's start what is claims can anyone uh, answer this question from my friends? Claim is money. <laughs> yes. Yeah, claim is money. Okay. 
So the Oxford, uh, Oxford Dictionary actually the, uh, defines claim as being a demand for something considered uh, once due. So the money someone owes to someone else. So on what basis actually? Just let's find out. So there has to be a contractual or legal ob obligation between the parties. So I can understand contractual, but uh, can anyone tell me about the legal obligation? <coughs> Yeah, you can say that. Usually, I, I'll just give an example that uh, a contractor working on a, a multi-story building in in the middle of a neighborhood. So, who do you think will be he'll be obliged legally to? Of course, the the, the neighborhood, right? Not only in Sharia law, even in the common law, it's very important that you should take care of the uh, ob obligations of the neighbors. Then, Ministry of Transport, municipality. So if you cause any damage to them, they are going to come after you for the claims. Mm -hmm. Okay. So to start with, uh, there has to be a cause for a claim. For any claim, there has to be a cause. And that cause is usually a breach of obligation by a party, breach of legal or contractual obligation by a party. Okay. So then if the breach, it has some effect and this causes damage to other party, so that is uh, the second thing, important thing. So always whenever you submit your claim, so you are uh, actually supposed to uh, link the cause with the effect. Sometimes all the causes will not have an effect. Um, recently actually in, in one of our, uh, we were concluding um, a consultancy agreement, a supplementary, uh, supplementary consultancy agreement. So I came to know that there are multiple types of uh, breaches. So in this case, in the uh, case of claims, usually the, the material breach is the one which, which usually actually have actual harm. Some We have anticipatory breach as well which, which actually um, you can say a client, uh, uh, a contractor's uh, uh, hint to, to not fulfill some obligation in the future. So of course you, you don't have the harm now. So there will be a harm but still the material breaches are the one which will have uh, uh, a tangible damage. Okay, so if you have a cause and then it has some effect, so the affected party has a claim. In construction industry, a contractual claim must be based upon the express or implied terms of the contract. So what are the express or implied terms? Anyone? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I'll just give you an example. Uh, Express, I'll give you an example that a contractor uh, in his preliminaries, somewhere in the contract, he is supposed to provide uh, Intel Core i7 uh, laptops to the employer. This is an express uh, term. And of course, uh, the, the contractor, he is, to, he is going to buy those uh, laptops. Implied terms, somewhere in the contract, it is written that the, the contract ha contractor has to uh, provide good quality computers or laptops. This is an implied term because both parties will have different meanings to imply, uh, this implied term. The employer will be expecting a good quality means a better quality or best quality. Whereas the contractor at the same time, he want to save money and he will give a reasonable quality. So even this is a cause of claims in, in uh, the interpretation of the clauses. It is actually a cause of uh, claims most of the times. So we'll just go through some reasons of claims. There are many other but just I mean because in, in this short presentation I can just summarize these errors or discrepancies in the drawings resulting in abortive works, delay in supply of uh, necessary design data drawings to the contractors on time and this is going to delay him of course, uh, failure in providing access to the site. This is a very clear uh, breach variation which results in delay and disrupt, uh, disruption. So just on this point, what do you think, why the variation is cause of a claim? Because it was not uh, originally Absolutely, absolutely. The, the contractor, he mobilized his resources based on the original scope of work, but 
through the i mean during the project you gave him a variation as a as an employer the variation you have some priority so of course he is not going to get more resources in, in, into the site so what he will do he will utilize the similar resources available resources and this is going to sometime this is going to delay or disrupt the project okay suspension and termination of any part or section of the works by the employer uh, failure in mobilization by the contractor or subcontractor uh, resourcing issues of the contractors and subcontractors okay so uh, types of construction claim actually as as i told you uh, my focus will be on the time claims so it uh, i will uh, categorize into three types of uh, uh, construction claims of, uh, with regards to time extension of time claims disruption claims and acceleration claims so mostly uh, i'll just uh, tell you my uh, my feeling all the time that usually people uh, they confuse extension of time claims with disruption claims so they are little bit different so we'll just find out extension of time i think most of you you know about these uh, type of claims so critical delays which affect the activities on the critical path of the construction program give rise to extension of time claims so i think you know or you you know about uh, critical path right so this is the longest uh, from start to finish time of the project so if any delay to the critical path which this will lead to extension of time this is going to delay the project uh, completion so of course if there is a delay to the project completion this is going to cause uh, uh, increase in direct and in indirect cost uh, cost of the of the contractor disruption claims so disruption claims are actually due to non critical delays not to the critical delays non critical delays to the construction program most of the times they are not going to uh, increase the project duration but they are uh, cause of loss of productivity so the the contractor is going to lose productivity due to interference dist disturbance as we uh, uh, speak about um, variation before variation is also sometime cause of uh, disruption so there is a difference between these two extension of time is due to the critical delays disruption is due to the non critical delays or and in the future if someone is going to ask you this question of course uh, and i think most of you you already knew know it but this is for your uh, future reference as well acceleration so very obvious from the name that the contractor or of course most of the time the contractor is going to accelerate because he is the one who is performing so contractor he will increase his resources and working time to achieve a target milestone there are some uh, types of acceleration these actually i just categorize them just uh, for a better understanding but you can ho have your own uh, references so instructed acceleration very obvious from the name this is instructed by someone so when acceleration is instructed by an employer of course he is going to pay money and time as well uh, to the to the contractor to achieve a certain uh, milestone uh, contractor is entitled to cost and time constructive acceleration this is carried out by the contractor to reduce potential delay uh, cost and penalties because when when the contractor he come to know that come to know that uh, he is going to delay the project so he will try to mitigate his uh, time and cost so this is where the constructive acceleration comes in so there will be no cost and time for the constructive acceleration there is another type this is actually i just uh, was not able to differentiate it but this is different uh, before actually the, the last constructive acceleration i'll tell you uh, one um, legal maxim from uh, common law very actually most of many many cases uh, uh, from the construction and other cases also on, in, in civil law that is <clears throat> they, they judge actually based on 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 this legal maxim uh, there is a latin name of it but uh, the meaning in english is one cannot benefit from his own wrong so if some if a party it it, it seems that he is on a wrong uh, if he, if he done some wrong, done something wrong to the contractor or the other party he can also not take the benefit of that okay so in case of a valid extension of time uh, claim reject rejection um, let's say there is a valid extension of time claim by the contractor and he know that this is a solid claim which cannot be rejected let's say the, this is uh, um, out of uh, employer's risk event or force majeure uh, or purely employer's delay 
so he knew that he know that uh, he, uh, this is a valid extension of time claim but this is rejected by the engineer and the employer as well but on the other hand they tell him to complete the project on time so the contractor he should do what he should do is obey the instruction to complete the project on time but submit or notify of constructive acceleration so this is actually very distant from other constructive acceleration here the contractor he is uh, entitled to cost and time if the engineer or the employer they will not give him the courts are going to give him so this is a very clear case of uh, one cannot benefit from his own wrong critical delays these are actually very important to understand usually we think that this is not our uh, area this is mostly uh, planning uh, engineers or planning uh, managers area but still we, we we need to actually know about this if let's say if tomorrow uh, any one of you is working with the cost consultant so at least he he know this uh, uh, these delays compensable delays very obvious from the name compensable compensation compensated so these are employers delay event the contractor is basically compensated uh, he is entitled to extension of time and recovery of cost classic examples are delayed uh, drawing or instruction from the employer delayed access to the site compensable delay please, please uh, just focus on these because uh, later on we'll have a small question a workshop so at least you all can understand and answer that excusable delays obvious from the name excusable both parties are excused from any liability these are actually neutral or independent delay events contractor is only entitled to an extension of time but no recovery of cost because the other party is not uh, in default so nobody is going to pay money to the contractor classic examples are exceptionally adverse climatic condition delay uh, caused by the authorities war uh, force majeure inexcusable delays obvious from the name again inexcusable or culpable delays the contractor delay event the contractor is in default contractor is not entitled to extension of time or recovery of associated cost on top of that there will be liquidated damages and uh, penalties applied by the employer classic examples again are delayed mobilization by the contractor or a subcontractor delay in design by the design and build contractor etc concurrent delays these are actually most talked about uh, delays and usually we get confused uh, that what are the concurrent delays so we are going to discuss actually a little more in uh, not in detail but just in a way that we can understand better so two or more delay events arise at the same time so two events from two different parties by the contractor and by the employer as well at the same time so only the net impact can be awarded based on circumstances so these are concurrent delays are actually very uh, similar to excusable delays so where you you get the uh, the time but not the money so what are the examples uh, employer cannot give access to a section of a certain uh, area of the site and uh, contractor also did not complete his design for that section so both are in delay okay so you understood now concurrent delays actually both parties they delayed right okay so what do you think if you see this uh, example the contractor uh, the, actually the project uh, the original program was uh, 11 months but the the project completed with a delay of 10 months in 21 months there are some uh, delays from the contractors you can see six months and there are some employers delay so if you see the delay analysis delay analysis actually in, in itself if, if any planning manager or engineer is sitting here he knows about delay analysis let's leave that for for later so what do you think in my opinion if i say that inexcusable delays because these are contractors delay so i should uh, actually that uh, i should nominate six months of delay there will be no extension of time there will be no cost and lds will apply so six months are inexcusable delay and then there are compensable delays from the contact from the employer side seven months so 
what do you think do you have any other thought on this okay 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 good good actually that's how it should be so three months our contract is delay the other three months which are concurrent again i will quote that one cannot benefit from his own wrong the employer he is also delay how he can benefit uh, get benefit of these three months right he cannot apply delay damages so it's very obvious and even for the for the contractor same thing he not he is not going to get any uh, cost for this because he is also in default in these uh, three months so three months of inexcusable delay three months of concurrent delays and four months of compensable delays so that's how we are going to categorize these i hope you you understood this much better okay this is very actually uh, important to uh, remember these are pacing delays when a contractor anticipate any delay from the employer side based on the rationale that uh, why should i hurry up and wait so the contractor if he sees that there are some delays uh, from the employer he also delays he also focus on some other part of the project there is an example the contractor anticipate that the employer is going to delay the drawings for a certain section of the works he delays the procurement of the material and resources for the same part so what he will do he will invest on some other areas of the project uh, but actually he is obliged to to work by by his own program right so again he should not benefit from from his own he is doing the wrong and he should not take advantage he is actually trying to save money so this is also wrong you have to be very careful about pacing delays so how to prepare an ideal claim i think nowadays uh, people are much uh, informed much educated so you will not get these kind of uh, global or rolled up claims this is a direct comparison between as planned and as built program without any delay uh, so without any delay analysis and as planned cost and actual cost and they will submit a difference this is actually a very lame um, approach to prepare a claim this is not any uh, this is not an ideal uh, situation and 9 out of 10 you are going to get this uh, rejected so what should you do you should prepare cause and effect based claim which we actually we we discussed in the start that you should link the cause with the effect prove entitlement and provide the substantiation entitlement under the law or under the contract so this methodology is mostly accepted by the by the claims consultant or someone with the claims knowledge he is going to understand this if in your claim narrative you have mentioned cause maybe four five lines two three paras then the effect sometimes the effect is not the same maybe it's there is a different effect or the impact is not as big as the contractor is claiming so you have to be very careful when you prepare or either you review entitlement sometimes you don't find any entitlement if you're not working under uh, uh, let's say a, a standard form of contract so sometimes bespoke uh, form of contract they don't have any uh, methodology of the claims so you should have uh, actually also if if there is no entitlement uh, within the contract most of the uh, the laws common law or civil law or even the sharia law there is uh, entitlement so you can get uh, an entitlement you just write that so it's very uh, important to establish a causal link between delay events and its effect on the project prove entitlement and provide substantiation thank you very much i hope you learned something out of this thank you thank you very much mr babar uh, now we will start the question and answer session and uh, may i request mr suhail and mr iqbal to support us so both our speakers mr laik and mr babar will answer your questions so we'll start from the right side and uh, could you please raise your hand if you have any question and then i will request our support team 
to bring a mic to you. So you can ask a question, please. No question. Question from the right side, please. Yes, sir. Uh, sorry, it's not a question. Uh, I just want to say thank you guys for inviting me and extremely informative and brilliant session. And I wish you all very good luck. Please keep doing the good work for the benefit of the society, especially the Jewish society, and for uh, everybody who is looking for the information and what the goal is here. Thank you so much. Thank, thank, you. You. thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you very much. Any question from the left side? Yes, please, Mr. Basar. Can you please give him the mic? Just thank you for your valuable time and Yeah, sure. The RICS website, there are many courses they, uh, they are offering. Some courses are free, some courses are available. So it's all up to you because see, there is no any specific place to learn knowledge. Knowledge you can gain from anywhere. It's not only just RICS or CIOB or CIRB or any other platform who is providing the knowledge. So if you feel that that course which RICS is offering, is good for you and that will help you in your APC process or if not in APC process, forget about the APC process, it will help you in your career, in your profession. I would suggest, yes, go ahead and do it. Other than that, as I said, there are so many other platforms, so other, I mean, uh, paid or un, uh, unpaid free uh, webinars or trainings available. So yes, I will always recommend, go ahead and then because knowledge is something you can, it's like an ocean. The much you can get it, Thank you very much. Now we will have the next question from our right side. Could you please raise your hands if you have any question? I will come back to you, sir. Thank you. See, sorry, your name? Smile. Smile. Smile, there are many platforms. Of course, we as a RICS member, or I as a RICS member, I will not, I mean, say, recommend you to go anywhere else. They are, as the gentleman asked, there are various courses, there are various uh, training provided by the RSCS. You can go ahead with that. But yes, on the other hand, I will always recommend whoever providing you or offering you a course where you feel that will be good for you, you should go ahead with that. So there is no specific platform. There is no specific uh, Institute, it's all up to you. But don't we have anything, I mean, any platform which is funded by, by you or by, by the team? The only platform I recommend RSCS. You okay. hear the channel. Okay. So go with RSCS. But again, with all due respect, with other professional bodies, as I say, they are CIOB who are doing very well in the kingdom. They are growing so many events. They are CIRB. So, another, I mean, IIQS, SLQS, they're all providing, they're offering different courses. So, yes, you should go anywhere where you find any knowledge, even if it's just like a one line, you should go ahead with that. The second question is in the, in the slide earlier, we have seen the sample for the case study. So do we, do we get the complete sample of the case study so that it's managed by the No, so no. Do we have any copies on the website? Or? No, you will, you will get the format, but you will not find anything. And there is no specific book. And the reason many specific, uh, candidates, they ask, is there a specific book from where we learn, from where we get a study or knowledge from the RSCS? And what is the reason why there is no specific books like how we used to study in our college and in the school, we have a books and we know that our final exam will be from this book. So we always study and prepare ourselves for the final exams in the school and college and universities. But why not RSCS offering such books? The reason, as I just answered to the gentleman, it's like an open ocean. Because once RSCS will offer you a book but they compile all the knowledge in a one book. It means you will not see abroad. You will not see, you know, the behind the box. 
You will focus on that books and you prepare yourself. So they want to keep it everything open. Go out, learn whoever is offering you, and get the knowledge. So there is no limit because knowledge has no limit. The RSC uh, courses are have no limit. There are plenty of courses available from RSC and different professional bodies. So there is no such kind of specific information or specific course. Yeah, they are like a BSc course in quantity surveying, project management. They are MSc. There are so many other that you can do it. But in terms of RSCS, no, there is no specific book. Yes, courses are available on different pathways which, which you can avail it. Some are paid, some are free. You are this is my question. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Ismail. Uh, just uh, to add on top of uh, what Mr. Like said, if you need personal uh, help, if you want to find a counselor for yourself, you need you know technical or any support, QSAP platform is available and we are willing to help you. Please do contact us. Yeah. You can contact our team and uh, we'll be at your uh, disposal. Thank you very much. Now we'll have the next question from left side. Uh, Mr. Zubair, please. See, first of all, our today's session was more focusing about summary of experience and case studies. The CPD presentation, final assessment interview are not included in it. As I said, we will probably plan another session where we will guide you about the presentation when your, I think, final assessment will start. The CPD is a very, very important component, one of the RSCS submission. And the question is very good because some of the can, most of the candidate, I would say, not even some, most of the candidate, they miss one point. First of all, you have a 48 hours required. When they submit there, let's say, I mean, this, as I said, submission is going to be open from 1st March to 15 March. When they provide the CPD, the CPD will show the last achieved CPD, let's say, in November. So it means from since November till March, the candidate they didn't attend any CPD, didn't attend any seminar, he didn't learn anything. This is a big gap for you. So it's not a good thing to provide or submit your CPD log without having updated information. So try like, for example, you are some going to submit, you are upload your information on 1st of March to 15th of March. So at least, at least the last CPD must be conducted at least like in Feb, ideally. If not then Feb, then mid of January. So it's good to be at the CPD events and the and uh, mention in your log. Is there anything else? Learning outcomes you have to write in your log that for example like today's event I will give you an example. Now we have a two presentation one is about claims and second is about the RSCS preparation. So what learning you have basically achieved the knowledge you have to write it. The plan basically that is for the RSCS website where you have planned that okay I will achieve that many CPDs or hours by the end of the year. So when you will upload, when you will update your CPD awards by end of December 2023, so what was your plan? You will say yes, achieve or is still ongoing. And for example, RSCS preparation, APC preparation is ongoing process, is ongoing CPD you can, you, where you have interact with your counselor, attending seminars and, and, and uh, different CPD events. So that's your plan. So at the end of the year, you have to say what was your plan and what you achieve. And the achievement, you have to write in your log that what you achieve from the CPD event. I hope I answer your question. Sir, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. We will have two more questions because of the time constraint. Right side, please. Give the mic to our friend here. Hello. Uh, good evening, everyone. 
everyone. Sure. I want to thank you, Mr. Light, for inviting me for this uh, Presently, I'm a PC candidate uh, for attendance. Uh, for the purpose for everybody, I just want to ask uh, if uh, in the new platform of RLCS online, there is uh, it was new introduced. So we are not familiar with this one. So if and whenever have experience on the new platform, in, uh, in uploading in the, in the process, you know, uh, if it, uh, it is my in my opinion that it is better if we have a guideline, a process, procedure to follow uh, step one, two, three for that purpose. So that when we go into that RSS online website, so it's I think it's very it could make it a very smooth way how to proceed from step one to the end until uh, our uh, respective counselor approve our submission. Uh, for that purpose, I ask uh, any uh, from the QSAP for uh, external support. Thank you. Right. Uh, Sijun, thank you so much for this question. Um, first of all, always be in touch on LinkedIn because yesterday, I believe, or day before yesterday, RSCS, we share one post and wherein we mentioned that those candidate, APC candidate, they are going to upload their documents from 1st of March. There is a session they are offered. Maybe it will be about to start very soon, maybe like 27th of February. So here you go. So RSE always offer. This is for the submission and when the final assessment will come, we will have an open session for the uh, preparation of the interviews for the final assessment. So we always offer different sessions that you have to keep an eye. So you can either you can ask your counselor. As I said, I mean, we know that we already share this information on LinkedIn. It's been posted and I'm not sure about the website is available or not, but on LinkedIn, we already shared uh, as an official announcement that on 27th, there is a session where the RSCS teach, uh, you know, the team will explain you the procedure, how you go step by step and submit your final submissions. Yeah, that's Lady Manju. She basically shared that post. Okay. One last question from the left side, please. Uh, okay. No, that is excluding. 3000 word is only your main content of case studies, excluding appendices or your disclaimer or anything you have added in, the, in that. So you have to write the 3000 word start from my role till conclusion or achievement or lesson learned. References means what? That that would all go in appendix. So the appendix will not count. Yeah. Sorry, that gentleman. Sorry, we'll take a last question because yeah, he's asking. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Mr. Baba. Please close. Yes, there are uh, many approaches. It depends upon the project. There is measured mile approach. If you think that not the major uh, part of the project is, is delayed, of course, all the project is not delayed. Usually, when you are at the end, as built program, uh, impacted as, as built program, that is uh, good methodology. Impacted as planned when you are very early in the, in the, in the project. So I would say it, it depends actually. You have to go through the SEL protocol. So there is actually um, uh, you'll you'll get a good guidance there. So you can because I'm basically I'm a QS, so I'm not a planner, but still I have some uh, you know also for you. That's why I actually I explained this. So you'll have a better understanding if you are going to go to SEL protocol. Just check there which is the best. But in my opinion, what uh, 
I can think of is the impacted as a build program. And there are time slice window analysis, measured mile approach. Of course, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, now uh, it's shields and certificate ceremony. We want to have it now. And uh, we as QSAP would like to give a token of appreciation to our speakers for that. And I would like to request Mr. Abdullah Rizwan, who is our chief guest today, to please come on stage and present uh, shields to our speakers. Thank you, Thank you very much. Mr. Like, could you please come on stage? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lake, for your time and for your uh, CPD uh, lecture today. Now I would like to call upon Mr. Babar Zahi to please come on stage and collect his shield. Thank you very much, Mr. Babar. Mr. Babar actually has traveled all the way from Medina to Riyadh. Thank you very much for coming over and educating us. Sir, please have a seat. Uh, now I would like to request our QSAP chairman, Mr. Laik, to please come on stage and present a shield to our guest of honor today, to Mr. Abdullah Rizwan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Abdullah, for coming. Now, the next shield, I would like to request Mr. Lake once again to please come on stage. I will stay there. And, yeah, please. Stay us for, for, for a few more minutes. And the next uh, appreciation shield we want to give to our outstanding contributor, Mr. Tanveer. Thanks Thank you very much, Mr. Tanvir, for your contribution. Thank you. The next uh, shield will go to Mr. Majid Moaisab. Yeah. Yeah. And this is uh, for continuity of support. Thank you, Mr. Majid. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Now we will distribute few certificates of appreciations to our core team members of KSA Riyadh chapter. They actually work very hard to make this event successful. So I would like to request again Mr. Lake to please come over on stage. And we will start with Mr. Naveed Mubarak for guest of honor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Naveed. The second certificate, Mr. Vaseem Raja Maiman for active community support. Thank you, Sam. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vaseem, sir. Please. Thank you. Thank you. The next certificate of appreciation is for Shahid Iqbal Bhatsab for active volunteer member of QSAP Chapter Riyadh. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Shah. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. The next certificate is for Mr. Faizan Hussain, active volunteer member. Thank you. Thank you. Next certificate is for Mr. Muhammad Rohail Farooq for the active support member. Thank you, Thank you very much, Mr. Rohail. He is actually not uh, a QS, but still he is uh, supporting us for all uh, these events. Thank you, Mr. Rohil. So, thank you, Mr. Lai. Thank you. Uh, I would like to request Mr. Babur to please come on stage. Thank you. Uh, now, we will give the next certificate of appreciation to Mr. Adil Bashir for active volunteer member of Riyadh KSA chapter. Thank you very much, Mr. Adil. Well, the next one is for our very famous Mr. GQ, Mr. Gulam Kadar, for active member support, KSA QSAP Riyadh chapter. He's our media partner. <laughs> yeah, he's our <laughs> official media partner as well. <laughs> The next certificate of appreciation is for Mr. Kesar Ali, for active member volunteer of Riyadh chapter, Mr. Kesar Ali Chadar. Thank you very much, Mr. Kesar, for your efforts. So the last certificate for active volunteer member goes to Mr. Zagam Abbas Chadar, please come on stage. Thank you, Mr. Zagam. Thank you, Mr. Babur. So, uh, just one note for everyone please make yourself available for a group photo in the end of the event. So that's the end of this exciting and knowledgeable CBD event. We hope all professionals who attended today's event have learned a lot. On behalf of QSAP, we appreciate the entire QSAP KSA core team members and volunteer members who organize such a wonderful event. Quantity Surveyor Association of Pakistan is pleased to announce that two hours of CPD certificates will be sent to all of you via email or WhatsApp. Please feel free to give your feedback or suggestions on today's event via QSAP official communication channel. We will welcome your feedback and we'll see you next time at another CPD event inshallah do follow us on announcements for announcements and updates on qsap linkedin page please until then assalamu alaikum and goodbye